Welcome everyone. Thanks again for coming to the uh, St. John's Rehab Doctors Talk. And uh, today we have a special guest lecturer, uh, Dr. Barbara Haas. Dr. Haas has her PhD in Trauma Health Services. She's a trauma surgeon, so she's completed not only her uh, surgery residency, but she's also completed two fellowships, one in adult critical care medicine and one in uh, trauma surgery at Cook County in Chicago, which is not an easy place to see trauma patients. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery here at the University of Toronto. And uh, she and I met because uh, I heard that she was interested in geriatrics and trauma. And I have to say, we're very blessed to have a group of trauma surgeons who are quite uh, functionally focused and uh, very much focused on long-term outcomes, just not on not just on that acute care saving the life, but really the long-term outcomes. We're very blessed to have uh, that group, and especially Dr. Haas. And also, Dr. Haas is a really fun person, uh, as you'll, I'm sure you'll see during her lecture. Robert? Uh, thank you very much. It's really a nice treat for me to be here today. I have to tell you that this group pr probably provides, gives me the best part of my job, which is, you know, we send patients to rehab and they, you know, aren't walking and they don't look like themselves. And, you know, I've seen them in their hospital gowns. And then a month later, they come to see me in clinic. And it's really cool because well, hey, they don't recognize me because they're del you fix their delirium. And uh, two, I don't recognize them because they're they're walking. Um, you know, and if I just had a patient last week. She was she was taken care of here and she left her wheelchair in the hallway to walk into my uh, exam room um, and high five me, which is the deal that we made when she was still in the hospital. And and you guys make that possible. And I'm, I'm being quite honest when I say that's probably the best part of my job. And uh, I'm very aware that you guys are the ones who make that part happen. So it's really a big treat for me to be here and to share with you what my research interests are. And, and hopefully, um, you know, uh, we, we can find some things to work on together. So when a patient has a severe injury, like in a car crash, uh, basically one of two things can happen. They can either go to the closest hospital or they can go to a trauma center. Uh, in Ontario, there's actually only nine adult trauma centers. Uh, two of them are in Toronto. Um, and it makes a big difference. This you know, landmark paper showed that if a severely injured patient is taken to a trauma center, their chance of surviving that injury is 25% higher than if they went to a non-trauma center. And we know that's because of the equipment, the people, uh, the processes of care, and really the, the focus of the entire trauma system from the EMS to the emergency department, to the inpatient care, to the rehabilitation part of the trauma system that you take part of. And you know this is true at St. Michael's Hospital at Sunnybrook where I work. And we know that even if hospitals have the same number of people, the same human and physical resources, patient survival is better at a designated trauma center than at a non-trauma center. So getting, severely injured patient to the right place at the right time is really critical. And you might be asking, well, Barbara, there's only nine trauma centers, so what happens at a non-trauma center? And the answer is it depends. There's really no standard of trauma care outside of trauma centers. Um, the doctors may not even have basic uh, trauma care training. There may not be a transfer protocol to identify those people who need to go to a place like Sunnybrook and St. Mike's. They may have the stuff they need to take care of these patients. They may not. Um, and there's really no standard expeditious process to get these patients to the right care. So it's really a little bit of a Russian roulette for the patient when that car crash happens or that fall happens, but where they go. So we, we looked at this. We said, OK, well, what's going on in Ontario? In Ontario, 85% of us live within an hour of a trauma center. So we are geographically vast, but most of us live near the lakes and most of us live within an hour of a trauma center. So it would make sense that if everything was working perfectly, most people who are severely injured would go to a trauma center. This is what we found. Just over a third of patients went from the scene to a trauma center and two thirds went to what we would call the wrong place. Hashtag wrong place. Um, and then, uh, in total, about 18% of the entire total were transferred to a trauma center. But that means that 71 of the 
percent of the patients who went to the wrong place in the first place stayed there. We said, okay, well, maybe it doesn't make that big a deal. Maybe the patients who are really badly hurt are in fact making it to the right place. So we looked at deaths. So in, in that cohort, about 16% of patients died. And we what we found is that of the patients that eventually died, the numbers were exactly the same. About a third went to a trauma center and two thirds went to a non-trauma center. And 13% were transferred and half were not transferred. So that means that in the province at the time that we did this study, and this was finished in about 2009, half of the deaths in this province related to severe trauma were happening outside of trauma centers, of those that hit the emergency department door, not counting the ones who died on the highway or um, prior to being hospitalized. So this was a problem. And when we looked at it more closely, um, we realized that the problem was even more complicated because it wasn't just random chance that made people go to the wrong hospital. There were very specific patient characteristics. And basically that was if you were a woman, you had a much lower chance of getting to the right place, regardless of age, regardless of severity of injury. And if you were an older adult, you had a much lower chance of getting to the right hospital. And if you're an older woman, forget about it. So this really sparked my interest in, you know, what are we doing for our older patients? And at this time I was even more naive than I am now. And I thought, you know, geriatric trauma, it's such a niche, it's just a few patients, but that didn't prove to be true. And I also thought, well, maybe it's a rurality problem. So we actually looked at numbers just in the Golden Horseshoe. And what we found was identical. The younger you were, even if you live really close to a trauma center, the more likely you were to get appropriate care. So this got me to thinking, you know, how much of a problem is this and what is the problem? And, and part of it, I think, and I hope I can convince you, is that we need to relearn as a culture of healthcare providers what a severely injured patient looks like. When we think of severely injured patients, we think of, you know, young men on motorcycles or someone getting shot. But this is the reality now and this and this. And we know that a older person getting injured has a much more likely um, bad outcome than a young person. We know that about after the age of 55, your chance of dying of your injuries goes up significantly. But it's not a niche problem. This was a nice paper published by Andrea Hill and Rob Fowler out of Sunnybrook. And they looked at all severely injured patients in Canada between 2002 and 2009. And at that time, already 38% of the patients were age 65 and over. So it wasn't a niche, it was almost half of the patients. And remember, this is now eight year old data. So the problem's just getting worse. And what they found was that it was really the, uh, the older elderly that were increasing in size. Because remember, you know, Old, older age right now isn't the same as it was in the 1950s. People are living longer, there's higher expectations around good quality of life, and people are doing stuff, right? My older adults are not being admitted after falls. Some of them are being admitted after crashing their motorcycle or you know, having a skidoo accident or skydiving. I maybe have made up the last one, but you get the idea. So our patients are changing, they're increasing in number, and it's not okay anymore to just say, well, whatever. So that got me to think about what do we know about these patients now? What happens to them? Um, what, how are we taking care of them? So if you go through the literature about what we know about older, severely injured adults, the answer is we actually know very, very little about what happens to these patients. So this is a typical study. This study looked at severely injured patients in Alberta who had an ISS of greater than 12. And, ISS is just a way that we measure severity of injury. Anything over 15 is considered severe injury. Anything over 12 is moderate to severe injury. And again, this was 2002 to 2006. And basically what they showed was that if you were older, um, a few years out from your trauma, you were less likely to be alive. But is that true even if they hadn't been in a car crash or a motorcycle accident? Nobody really knows. Uh, this was another paper that came out in 2011. This was the plenary paper at the biggest trauma conference in the world. And, you know, they ask, is the glass half full? And that's kind of the typical 
um, attitude you'll see around geriatric trauma. It's like, well, it's not that bad. So uh, again, they looked uh, 10 years back and looked at older adults now with an ISS of 30. So that's very badly injured. And they looked in a single center, um, 145 patients. Their mean age was 78. About a third died and two thirds went home. And then they looked at how long they lived for. And they looked at, you know, when, when were 50% when when were 50 of them still alive? And they showed that that was around three years. And they showed that at five years, about a third of them were still alive. And so the question was, is this half full or half empty? And I say, who knows? What would that cohort have looked, what would those patients have looked like if they'd never gone into that accident? Would the same number still be alive? We really have no way of knowing. And that's really the challenge with geriatric trauma. Geriatric, the trauma literature is centered around young people. So we assume that, you know, if the patient died, it was because they were in a car crash. We know that isn't true for older adults. And the way that we do our trauma research hasn't really evolved to account for this in our um, trauma population. Um, this is another study that sort of illustrates the same issue. Um, this again, a single level uh, one trauma center, about 1,300 patients, and they looked at those that had a same level fall or fall from standing. And again, their mean ISS was 16, so severely injured, and a quarter of them were very badly injured. And again, they showed that 12% had died in hospital, and 51% went to a skilled nursing facility, and a third went home, and 6% went home with assistance, and only 5% went to rehab. And the question is, good, bad? Can we do better? Was this great? There's really no context. So this kind of data doesn't help us achieve excellence because we don't know if this is a good outcome or a bad outcome. And that's the number one problem right now, I think, in the trauma literature in terms of elderly adults. And finally, this is a very large paper that looked at um, injured adults uh, across uh, 15 regions in Australia. And they um, identified 6,069 patients. And they tried to find the things that were predictors of older, of bad outcomes. What they found was age, being more severely injured, you know, being in the hospital longer, and having fallen. And they concluded that older adults with severe injuries were at risk of poor outcomes. Well, we, we kind of know that. And the question is, is there anything about these patients that we can identify that would tell us this patient is more high risk that we can actually change, right? We can't make our patients younger. We can't uh, go back and tell them not to fall. So what is it about them that we can change and ensure a better outcome? And remember, we talked at the beginning about the fact that trauma centers improve mortality, and that was a huge shift in the way people thought. People used to think that, you know, the only way to prevent death is to make sure everyone wears their seatbelt and drives the speed limit, and once the crash has happened, there's nothing you can do. Studying trauma centers show that that's not the case. And now, 20 years later, we're a little bit in that situation with our older um, injured adults. Um, and lastly, this was a... Um, study of 25,000 adults with severe injury. And this is, was, again, the outcome. And they basically looked at things that we cannot change. So age, gender, race, um, the type of injury that they had. But there's really no clue here about who can we target to make things better and what are some of the modifiable risk factors. Um, and lastly, I think this is a really cool study. It's not trauma-related, but I think... Um, those of us who are interested in long-term recovery, particularly after critical illness, um, should know about this paper if you haven't seen it already. So this was really neat. They basically followed um, patients over 10 years who were age 70 and above before they got sick. And every month they called them and they did a functional assessment. And over the course of the study, uh, just under 300 of them were admitted to the ICU. And they basically followed them before and after ICU. And again, what they showed was the best predictor of how you'll do after ICU is how you did before the ICU. So this is very helpful in terms of, you know, helping us advise families about how their loved one might do, but it doesn't tell us how to change the paradigm, how to fix the problem, how to, is there a way to get patients 
who are at risk for moderate to severe disability into the low disability um, category. So I guess what I'm trying to say is the real question for geriatric trauma is does anything make a difference? And I've just presented a whole bunch of papers to you that suggest maybe not, but I'd like to argue that in fact that's not true. We need to sort of move away from thinking that this is the outcome for geriatric trauma to, to aiming for this. So this is a study that we did a few years ago now, and we looked at the National Trauma Data Bank. That's basically a large rep repository of data looking at trauma centers across the United States and Canada. And we identified just under 90,000 patients across 132 facilities. And about a quarter of the entire population was older adults. And basically what we did was we looked at whether at each hospital there were more deaths than predicted or fewer deaths than predicted. So on the y-axis, um, you see that one has a line through it. So that means that based on the type of injury and the age and the vitals, if you have a score of one, that means that exactly the same number of patients died at your hospital that would be predicted. If your score is below one, indicated by green, that means that a lot more people survived at your hospital than would be predicted given the severity of injury and the age and how they got injured. If you are way over one, so on the far right of your screen indicated in red, that means a lot more people died than would be expected. You are underperforming. And what we found was that there was a huge variation in outcomes among elderly patients across hospitals. Some hospitals had way more survivors than would be expected, and some had way fewer. And what was interesting was that whether or not your elderly adults survived was not correlated with whether your young adults survived. So there was something different going on. There was something at that hospital that was being done differently for the older patients, such that they were doing better than average. And this is sort of a glimmer of hope, right? There's some hospitals that seem to get it, that seem to know what to do. And the real question is, what are they doing? And how can we all start doing that? Um, this is a similar study uh, that we did in Ontario from 2005 to 2011. And again, we looked at all patients admitted to our nine adult trauma centers. And as expected, about a third were aged over 65. It's less than the 40%, because remember, a lot of the patients never make it to the right hospital. And this is what we found. Depending, if you're an older adult, 65 and older, depending on which trauma center in Ontario you were admitted to, you had a much higher or a much lower chance of surviving your injuries. There are some places where you had a 50% higher chance of death compared to an average performing hospital. And there were some places where you had a 25% lower chance of death compared to the average hospital. And this is in Ontario where we're like pretty standardized. So again, it indicates that it is possible to modify outcomes because at some places things go well and some places things don't go well. So I think we need to, step one, discard this idea that outcomes are not modifiable. Can you say which one was Sunnybrook? I don't even know. I wasn't allowed to know. There's only two people in the world who knew and their bodies have been disposed of. <laughs> I like to, yeah. Um, so, so, okay, so we've established older adults make a huge portion of the severely injured population. We've established that we have a challenge even getting them to the right hospital. We've established that some hospitals seem to do better and some hospitals seem to do worse. Okay, so what is it at these hospitals that makes a difference? I'm gonna preface this with, I think we still don't know, but we have some hints. So one thing that seems to make a difference is whether a geriatrician sees the patient. So um, this was a, a pilot study, which is now no longer a pilot, but firmly established a standard of care at St. Michael's Hospital where everyone who was an older adult uh, was seen by a geriatrician and a geriatric nurse and the geriatric team within 72 hours of admission. And what we found was that number one, seemed to reduce delirium, but I think more importantly, fewer patients were discharged to long-term care after the geriatricians became involved than before. So more people had a discharge to home or to rehab than to long-term care. And I think that's huge 
I think, you know, keeping people in their home is probably the most important outcome after geriatric trauma, um, after survival. So I think this was huge. And they've been able to show that this effect persists over time. And in fact, we now have this program at Sunnybrook as well. Um, this was a, a similar study from the United States. Again, a single center that imp implemented a geriatric trauma consultation service. And they did a pre and post study looking at the effect on older adults. And they enrolled 106 patients, 85 of them survived, and they, in they saw them at three months, six months, and 12 months. And they saw a huge difference in terms of their ability to perform activities of daily living. And they also showed a difference in um, instrumental activities of daily living, particularly shopping, which I think is, I'm sure this audience can correct me, but is a really complex task that also represents, you know, the ability to be out of the house and to socialize and, and um, is really meaningful to people and a really meaningful outcome. So now I ask my patients when they come to clinic, can you go shopping? Um, so other than the geriatrician, what else might help? Well, there's some hints that just recognizing that older adults aren't just older adults, but that they're different might help. Uh, this is an older study, but I think it's sort of helps us organize things in our mind. So they basically looked at patients with blunt injury um, and they compared youngins to older adults. And they just, it was very simple. They looked at vital signs uh, and the probability of death because, you know, when the patient comes in and everyone crowds around them and that blood pressure comes up and it looks fine, everyone's like, eh, okay. And you can immediately see the residents kind of lose interest. Like, oh, it's just a, it's just a traumat, as they call it. And they kind of, you know, go back to doing what they were doing. There's no blood, there's nothing. No one gets very excited. So should they still be excited? And the answer is probably. So if you look at the range of blood pressures that look normal, so let's say 100 to 160, you can see that among the young adults, there's really very low probability of death. But that was virtually useless in predicting death in the elderly. And heart rate, same thing. You know, in, in the younger adults, unless the heart rate was very high or very low, people did fine. But again, it wasn't reliable in our older adults. And of course, this makes sense, right? Like if you think about it, you know, everyone's beta blocked. Maybe a blood pressure of 140 for Mrs. Smith is way lower than her usual 200. But it helps us sort of understand how we see these patients and reasons why we might not be recognizing that they're severely injured. Um, this was also another classic study, again, single center, but um, they looked at all patients um, who were 70 and over, and they looked at whether the patients even met criteria for the trauma team to be activated. And again, for those of you who haven't had the chance to come visit us at Sunnybrook, basically when a trauma comes in, this pager goes off, everyone runs downstairs or at Mosey's. Um, and there's an anesthetist and there's a surgery resident and there's a orthopedic resident and a bunch of staff show up and x-ray and everyone gets all excited. A lot of stuff happens very quickly. If you come in through the ER, eh, less quickly, you know, you might wait in triage for a while and then somebody will come and might order an x-ray and then might, and you know, so the workup is like six hours long. So they looked at whether their trauma team activation criteria identified um, sick older adults with injuries. And their criteria were low blood pressure or high heart rate, not breathing well, being in a coma, or being shot in the uh, torso. And what they found is among the older adults who were severely injured, only a quarter actually met these criteria. And when they looked at it, um, the ones that weren't meeting the criteria are the, were the ones who were in uh, car crashes or who had fallen. It was much more obvious if they were hit by a car, which I can tell you is pretty obvious, but it's the ones that have fallen or been in a car crash. And again, those of you who have worked in an emergency department, I'm sure have lived this experience where, you know, Mr. Smith crashed his car yesterday, he comes in for chest pain and he gets an ECG and he gets tropes and he, and after about four hours, people realize that the reason his chest hurts is because all of these ribs are broken and oh yes, he has a splenic laceration. So it's really something, as, as I said at the beginning, about recognizing what a sick patient looks like when they're older that we have trouble with. Um, and then they looked at the patients who did and did not meet these trauma activation criteria. 
And they showed that among the patients who did not meet criteria, where there was no fuss made, 16% of them died, a quarter of them were in the ICU within 24 hours, and just under 20% needed an operation. So again, emphasizing these patients are different and we're doing a terrible job at recognizing them. So one of the last things that has come up is, you know, it was one of the reasons some hospitals are better at this than others, because they just do more of it. There's very few things in medicine that don't show a volume outcome relationship. And so this is a paper that came in, out in the past year, uh, led by Zara Cooper. And they looked at all patients in California, um, and they identified just about 62,000 older adults with injuries at 63 trauma centers. And it included both severe and non-severe injuries. And what they looked at was this idea of failure to rescue. So there's two ways that patients do badly in a hospital. One, they have a complication. So it would be great if they didn't have a complication. But what's also critical is what happens after the complication happens. It's been shown over and over that high-performing hospitals pull those patients back from you know, the brink of death, so to speak, and are able to save them. And low-performing hospitals aren't able to save them. They have a failure to rescue. This has been shown in medicine. This has been shown in, in general surgery. It's even been shown in trauma at a general population. So the question is, is this also true for geriatric trauma patients? And here's what they showed. When they compared those hospitals um, that had the lowest proportion to the highest proportion of older adults, they found the ones that had the highest proportion, meaning the most experience, they had they had not only had lower mortality, but they had uh, less pro they were able to rescue those patients. So because of experience, they were able to pull those patients back from these complications like UTIs and strokes and heart attacks and actually rescue them. And that's why they were having better outcomes. It's not that they magically prevented every complication, but they were able to grab that patient and pull them back. And I think that's a really important finding. So I've talked about some of the stuff we do know. So we know some hospitals are better than others. We know that geriatricians seem to help. We know that it's something about recognizing severity of, of illness in the older trauma patients, and it's something to do with experience. But what do we still not know? So we actually don't have a good sense of what happens to these patients in the long term. So we don't really know what happens to them at five years. And what I mean is we don't know what happens to them at five years compared to other older adults. We don't know how their course deviates from what their life would have been like if they hadn't gone into a uh, car crash. And we also don't know, you know, is being admitted for an acetabular fracture different than just being admitted for um, pneumonia or, uh, you know, an isolated hip fracture? Or is it the same? Do these patients need different services or should we be targeting them the same way we, we target um, orthopedic hip fractures. Um, we still don't quite know what their access to care is like. The data that I showed you showing that it was very bad is now old, and so that needs to continue to be monitored. And we don't know very much about what their healthcare utilization is like after, and we don't know what it was like before, and we don't know how that affects outcome. And I think that's important because things like having access to rehab, having access to your family doctor might actually make all the difference in these older adults, and we have no idea what's happening at the moment. Um, the other question is, are there benefits to trauma center care for patients with non-severe injuries? And one of my colleagues, Burke Tillman, is, is looking at this as part of his PhD thesis. Are we doing things, you know, some, some patients who don't have severe injuries end up at trauma centers, and we consider that an economic burden, right? Because why are, we, why are trauma centers being flooded with these patients? But I think it'd be nice to look at what actually happens to these patients. Do they accidentally get better care than the patients who would have gone to a community hospital? I personally think they really benefit from our PT and OT and SLP and just interprofessional assessment. And I suspect they're much more likely to get on track to end up here. And so it'd be interesting to see what we're doing differently. Not to say that everyone should come to Sunnybrook, but to apply what we know from trauma centers to other hospitals. We also don't know what matters to these patients and to their families. Again, we think we do, but no one's actually ever asked them. Um, and this comes up most particularly when we're talking about taking patients 
to a trauma center rather than their closest hospital. There's always a lot of talk around the fact that, you know, older patients, they don't want to be away from their community. They want to be in the same hospital as their cardiologist. So we're actually doing them a favor by leaving them in a non-trauma center. I, I don't know if that's true, and I think it's time that we figure that out. We also don't know very much about how the way doctors think and nurses and other healthcare providers affects the outcomes of older adults. So I think we are the gatekeepers of the care that these patients provide. And if we as a group look at older adults with severe trauma as hopeless cases, we're not going to open the gates to um, things that might help them. And again, I see this in my residence. You know, I not to tell you anecdotes, but I had a patient come out of ICU last week. He came into the hospital completely functional. I mean, he's older. He didn't come in for trauma, but he came in like completely independent. And he's been in the ICU for two weeks and he's profoundly delirious. So, you know, he can't eat, he can't do stuff. And my senior resident said to me, I think this is his new baseline. And, you know, that's really disturbing that we're sort of raising the next generation of healthcare providers to think like that. Because if we think like that, then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We also don't know very much about how to integrate primary care providers into the care that we as a trauma system provide. You know, I always write, see your family doctor. I have no idea if that happens, and I think that's probably not the best approach to doing that. So I'll tell you a little bit about the projects that we're working on. I was going to tell you some, like, hot off the presses results, but this is being webcast, so I can't now because I don't want to be scooped. Also, in case the answers change, I don't want any evidence. Um, so the first study we're doing is a qualitative study, and we're focusing on older adults who were admitted for trauma within the last six months. We're trying to make sure we balance by age, sex, and where they live. And we're basically asking them, what is it like to be an older adult with trauma? What was it like being in the hospital? What were you most afraid of? Did people talk to you about that? What was follow-up like? Um, did you see your family doctor? What were the barriers in your fall? What were the things that went well? How did people treat you in the hospital? Did you feel like you're being treated like a grandma when on the inside you feel like a you know rock star? <laughs> Not that grandmas can't be rock stars. You get my point. You know, my grandma talks about this all the time. My grandma's always complaining how people think she's this fragile thing. And I'm like, but you're so frail, but I don't tell her that. Um, I want to specifically ask them, do you would you rather get the best possible care or do you want to just stay close to where you live? And if you want to stay close to where you live, what is it about that that we need to bring to Sunnybrook? And I want to ask them what outcomes and processes are most important to them. Uh, and we're recruiting. We're, uh, Leslie, here's my research coordinator. What we've already found out is that we have trouble recruiting because we're actually not following up these patients enough. So it's super hard to find anyone to do this because they're not coming back to our clinic. So there's already a finding there. But uh, hopefully within a year, I'll have some nice results for you. The other sort of set of work that I'm doing is done at ISIS. So ISIS is a, basically an organization that holds all of our healthcare records. Ontario is really cool because, because we have a single health payer system. I can find a patient at any emergency department and follow them all the way until the day that they die. And I can know all their doctor's visits and I can know all of your eMERGE visits, something that you can't do in a lot of jurisdictions. So it's really great for this kind of research. So what we're looking at are older adults, again, with severe injury over the last 10 years. And the questions we're asking are some of are pretty basic. Like, where, do, where are these patients going now? Have we gotten any better at sending them to the right place? Um, what's their mortality like? And where do they go after their injury? And does it depend what kind of care they got? And I can already tell you that if you adjust for age, frailty, severity of injury, everything, if you end up at a trauma center, you're more likely to get rehab or go home than if you go to a non-trauma center. And I think that's huge. Um, we're going to be able to look at the impact of geriatric consultation, not at a single hospital, but across the entire province. So every time a geriatrician sees a patient, they have a special code. I can tell whether you were seen by a geriatrician, and I can tell, I'll be able to tell whether that makes any long-term outcome difference and whether that affects where you go. We're also going to be able to follow patients at one, three, and five years, and we're going to be able to compare them to other older adults with similar levels of comorbidity and frailty to help us understand, are these patients different, or at a certain point after a week in hospital, are you just an older adult who's been in hospital for a week 
And for a subgroup, we're actually going to be able to look at, not at the level that you do, but sort of at a big picture level at functional outcomes. Because there's a subset of patients who've been getting their RI assessment leading up to the car crash, and then are going to get it after. And so it's actually a cool opportunity to track from before and after. Um, and we'll have a bigger number than I think is available in most other jurisdictions. And the last thing I want to look at is healthcare utilization, access to rehab, um, access to primary care, and how that impacts on outcomes. And the last thing I'm, uh, want, I think the second last thing I'm lying, the second last thing I want to tell you about is um, this uh, program where I'm trying to get started at Sunnybrook, looking at best practices in early geriatric trauma care. Remember I told you that our geriatricians kindly see our patients within 72 hours. But as you know, by 72 hours, a lot of the damage has been done. The patients are in collars, they're left in the emergency department, they're put NPO for C case ORs that may or may not happen. That's okay if you're 20, but it's not okay if you're 82. So what we really wanna focus on is the first 72 hours and focus on mobility and nutrition in the first 72 hours. So Leslie has already completed the literature review, and now we need to sort of put it all together with geriatric medicine, anesthesia, our ER colleagues in the ICU to improve the care that we provide in the first three days. Hopefully, meaning we'll get these patients to you in better shape. And lastly, future projects. So we talked about provider beliefs and the fact that ageism might be an issue. Um, I think we need to study that formally, and that's the plan. And as I talked about, sort of looking at the unexpected impact of trauma center care, discharge for rehab, and also long-term fall risk. Do you know is being seen by a team at Sunnybrook or at St. Mike's or at Kingston General mean that you're going to have less chance of falling in the future? Or does it make no difference? So that's all I have. Um, as you can tell, I'm very early in my career. I'm very excited. So hopefully, I'll come back with some data for you in the near future. And otherwise, if you have any thoughts, ideas, or comments, this is my email. And um, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you. And I'm happy to take any questions. It depends. And that's part of the problem. So. Um, there's criteria that the paramedics follow, and then there's criteria at each hospital. And then there's the criteria, what we would call like the literature criteria. So I'll start with the literature criteria. In the literature, to be considered a severe injury, you have to have codes that translate into an ISS of greater than 15. And this is pretty expert stuff. We have, we have two people that we paid just to do these calculations. It's kind of like the Apache score for trauma. It, that it's not intuitive. So, you know, after the patient has been discharged, somebody does all these calculations, and I can tell at the system level were they a severe trauma or not. But obviously, that's not how it works in real time. For the paramedics, they have a series of triage criteria based on, first of all, mechanism. So, you know, they have to have fallen or been in a car crash, and then looking at their vital signs, the types of injuries they have, like, for example, uh, paraplegia automatically goes to a trauma center, and then special considerations, among, among which age is now a category. And that tells them that those patients should bypass local hospitals and go to a trauma center. As I've pointed out, though, that clearly doesn't always work. Um, and then in hospital, it depends on whether you end up at a trauma center or a non-trauma center. At a non-trauma center, who knows? Like Those patients might be admitted under medicine, for example. Right, an elderly patient with a bunch of rib fractures probably going to end up under medicine. At our hospital, it's based on whether you get a trauma team activation. Um, and again, there's set criteria for that. So it's a bit of a challenge because what we call trauma and what is actually by the book's definition of trauma isn't always the same. For sure, for sure. And uh, again, it's you know it's very funny the difference. Whenever protocols are looked at, right, everything's clearly outlined in the protocol, and yet what the protocol says isn't happening. And I do think it has to do um, 
sort of with how we think about trauma. So I suspect patients with bad heads, um, you know, say, oh, they need a neurosurgeon, so they're going to be more likely to be transferred, whereas patients who don't need a special kind of doctor might stay. And for sure, the mechanism of injury plays a huge role. So it's really the falls that people aren't reading as a trauma, whereas, as you know, you know, someone who's 80 and they fall, they're not sort of like drifting to the ground. They, they have really major injuries, and I think people aren't aware of that. Barbara, I know that people who go to rehab aren't necessarily the same as people who go home or long-term care, but do you think if you adjust for the known factors, do you think it makes a difference where you go at time of discharge from acute care? I, I, I definitely think it does. So again, hush, hush, but you know, even adjusting for all of those things, which hospital you were taking care of affects whether you're going to get a rehab. So you're right, non-trauma centers and trauma centers have differently sick patients, but even if you adjust for all of that, there's still a huge discrepancy in access uh, based on the data that I have right now. So, and then in terms of what those patients are going to look like in five years, stay tuned. I mean, I have my biases, which is why I'm here, but... <laughs> Go ahead. Do you have a solid definition for geriatric? Is it by age or is it how complex their medical condition is? So uh, the usual cutoff is 65. We Some papers go as low as 55. Some people like older. And that's one of the, I think you've actually hit the nail on the head is that that's one of the issues. More and more data is supporting the idea that frailty is the determinant and not age. Um, and that's the challenge. So right now, you know, everyone who's 65 and over gets a geriatrician. They might not all need that. It might need, have to do with frailty. So the fact that we just sh smush everyone 65 and over together is part of the issue. We don't know what the subgroups are. Because, you know, the 85-year-old who's frail and has fallen may need a different kind of intervention than the 65-year-old motorcyclist, and that's not known from the literature just yet. And that, that's a huge problem. I can tell you that uh, a very what if, from what I've looked at the data again. This is all prelim and unofficial, but it seems like being long-term home care seems to be a pretty good indicator of that you're frail and that you might need help. Which I think is interesting because you know surgeons are lazy and don't know very. I'm just joking, but you know we don't we don't know as much about frailty scales as as you all may. So the question is, how can we pick up quickly on frailty? Um, and it's certainly easier to figure out that someone's getting long-term home care than to um, track down the family and talk about ADLs and IADLs, especially for a young, busy resident. So I'm hoping that kind of information might be helpful for us. I'm hearing uh, from, I was at the Trauma Quality Improvement Program, and we're starting to talk about trauma not as an acute condition, but really as a chronic condition that, you know, you're left with disability or impairment or things that affect you for a long time. And I'm just wondering your views on that. No, absolutely. Um, even the patients that look like they're doing well are often back at their baseline. And it's one of the challenges with older adults as well is that they have a higher probability of not returning to that baseline. So there needs to be, I think, a balance between sort of optimism and pushing for as hard as we can, for as good an outcome as we can get, but also dealing with that grief and dealing with the loss of independence and abilities that comes with it. Um, so I do think there's a balance, but I think I think first needs to come the optimism, right? And I and I think it's very hard to know how people are going to do until you give them some time to show you their trajectory. And uh, I think that's why I'm sort of trying to be as optimistic as I can, because I think we don't need more sort of eh, hopelessness out there. Any other questions? Thank you again. Thank you so much.